This is Steve Durbin. And this is not. Because that's Gary Cantrell. Listen to Heartland. Running podcast. Powered by S.W.O.R.D. Welcome to the Heartland Running Podcast. Join Crystal, Andy, and Stephen as they explore all things running related in the Heartland and beyond. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Heartland Running Podcast. We are the hosts that are not elite, but we can't be beat. Oh, that was terrible. Sorry, guys. That sounds that's all right. <laughs> it's all right. Okay. So anyway, I'm Andy. I'm Crystal. And I'm Steven. And we are here to entertain, inspire, and sometimes educate all the people getting outdoors and working towards your running goals, whatever they may be. Uh, as always, thank you very much for giving us a listen and deciding to give a portion of your day to sticking us in your ear, whether you're on your run or in your car. Uh, before we get started, I would like to thank... Swest1160, who left us a five-star iTunes review. They said, hosts keep the conversation fresh and informative, along with being entertaining. Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, if you do enjoy the show, please give us a review on iTunes or whatever podcast source you use. These reviews help us get noticed. So sometimes the show goes to the dogs, and this episode is no exception. And so I would like to introduce uh, Mikkel Becker. And uh, she is the lead animal trainer for FearFreePets.com and was a resident trainer at VetStreet.com. Mikkel is the co-author of six books, including the upcoming book, From Fearful to Fear Free. She specializes in reward-based training and behavior modifications for dogs and cats. Um, maybe you should you could teach my wife some things that would be helpful with us. Uh, but she also <laughs> works with a variety of animal species, including training work with orangutans and pigs. Mikkel is a Karen Pryor certified training partner, a certified behavior consultant canine, and certified professional dog trainer, and a certified dog behavior counselor, and a graduate of the rigorous San Francisco SPCA Dog Training Academy. Mikkel is fear free certified and has her bachelor's in communication from Washington State University. So that is quite an introduction. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Okay. Did we leave anything out? I think you got it. I I think uh, the only thing we didn't mention is I I almost thought about adding in that I've trained chickens and rats and and kind (laughs) of. All, all these odd, odd animals, but actually the really cool thing is, is um, even my daughter has been working on training. She has a beta fish. She can train even fish to do all kinds of really cool tricks. So it's it's pretty neat that every animal has that potential to do really neat things and we can communicate with them in that way. That's amazing. I think the first thing I want to know is why, what got you into animals? Now, your dad is a, a pretty famous vet. Was that, did he kind of inspire your calling? You know, definitely growing up with my dad as a vet and just always being a pet loving family, it, animals were just really a part of our family and just, I can't imagine my life without animals, but from the, the youngest age, I always thought I either wanted to be a broadcast journalist or I wanted to be a whale trainer or a horse trainer. So I kind of had those way back from maybe when I was three or four, I remember, remember I remember wanting to do that. So it's just always been a passion of mine and it's just really neat how the, how my courage has developed throughout the years. And I really went from going into college, wanting to do broadcast journalism. And then I realized that my heart just wasn't in it as much. And so it was really neat with that encouragement from my dad who said, you know, there's a way that you could actually do communication and do it with something that you really are passionate about, which is the animal. So I feel very blessed every single day to be able to do what I'm doing and to be able to help people and, and really to be able to help animals. All right. So in setting up this interview, uh, I know that uh, you've been extremely busy with some projects with the Fear Free program. Uh, can you just give us an explanation of what Free Fear is, or Fear Free is and uh, you know what your involvement in that has been? Yes. So Fear Free, it's really our, our passion project. It's all about reducing the fear, anxiety, and stress that pets experience. So it's all about both physical well-being and emotional well-being. And my dad is a veterinarian. I came to realize that a lot of pets when they visit the vet are extremely stressed out. And actually, the stress to the pet of taking them into the vet is the number one reason that pets don't go to the veterinary office as often as they should be. And the number three reason is the stress to the pet parent of having to take their pet in. So it's very, very stressful. 
And one of the really cool things about Fear Free, it's all about improving the emotional state of the animal during care. And also with the launch of Fear Free Happy Homes, it's also about improving the emotional well-being of pets in the home as well. So it's, it's all-encompassing. And, you know, when you look at behavior issues with animals, a lot of it really does stem from a lack of communication and also from a distressed mental state, emotional state. So it's all about improving that. And so I, I'm excited to do that because it really does improve the lives of pets and people. We are a running podcast, and that, that's, that's what we're really interested in discussing this evening. And so, you know, a lot of us have pets, we have dogs, and uh, a lot of us, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for a companion to run with us. And and mainly because, you know, we want it to be a uh, good experience for us with our canine com- companions, but we also want it to be a good experience for, for our dogs, too, or, um, and, and generally dogs is what people choose to run with. Uh, it seems like the best animal for for that sort of activity. And so so that's kind of what, what we want to talk about here uh, on this podcast is, you know, how, how do you pick out a, uh, a running partner or how do you decide if your your dog is adequate for that? And, you know, if, if you're going to if you're going to adopt a shelter dog, you know, how can, how can you look at that dog and tell, you know, this is going to be a, run, a good uh, running companion for me or look at them and say, you know, maybe this is not the best choice. And so that's kind of a lot of stuff to unwrap there. But what are your thoughts on that? So uh, as you mentioned, I, I definitely being able to rescue an animal, it's just such a gift to that animal. And really, I think it's an even get bigger gift to us because they have so much love to share and, and just really expand our lives and make our, our home so much fuller. And when we're looking at a pet at a shelter or we're looking um, for a pet elsewhere, it is important if you're looking for a running partner to find a a pet that's equipped for that. So uh, breed does come into play, but also there there are individual characteristics of dogs even within that breed. So if you take a lab, for instance, there are Labradors that are built more for maybe just short distance running. And there are some that are really built like high endurance kind of labs that are, are longer and leaner looking versus the, the bigger bones kind of, kind of pet lab. So you really want to look at that pet personality and their build. So when you're looking for a dog that's a good running partner, a lot of times they're going to have longer legs, a, a longer nose. So, so the dogs with the smush faces, I have a pug. He wouldn't be a great running partner. Uh, so definitely looking at, at dogs that they're equipped for that. So the longer nose, the longer legs, and also making sure that they have, have good joints. And um, because sometimes, especially with certain breeds that are prone to things like um, luxating patella or hip dysplasia, so really getting your, if you already have a dog too, having them checked by your vet is important because we can, we can accidentally do some damage to their, to their joints if we're running with them and they're in pain and our pets don't complain. They still, they just want to go. They want to be there with us. So it's important on our end to make sure that they're, they're healthy and equipped to do that kind of exercise. And when you're looking at the shelter, one of the things you can do is actually look on that pet's kennel card, or you can even talk with the staff and those that really know that pet really well, because they'll know the energy level of that dog. And some dogs just love to run like what they're born to do. And so you can find those dogs that are just naturally a great fit for, for being a good running partner. And it's pretty amazing too, because when our dogs are our workout buddies, it's really, really hard to say no. And we can't really come up with excuses because they just look at us, they give us that look, and we're like, oh gosh, you know, I, I guess I can't skip that run today or that walk today. So they, they're incredible motivation and, and definitely will fill, fill our homes with a lot of love as well. Okay, well, uh, you kind of described uh, my dog. I'm going to kind of talk about my dog for a minute. And uh, she is, uh, we, we got her as a puppy and she was a rescue dog. Um, and we went through quite the process to get her with references and we had to do an interview. And uh, But we were fortunate to get her, and she's definitely a blessing for our family. But she is uh, half lab, half Australian shepherd. and exact, and, But she looks more like a lab than anything. And, and so uh, she, she was exactly like what you described with the longer nose. Uh, she is long-legged. She's a leaner-type lab whenever you look at her. And she is very athletic, very quick. And, and so kind of some of the questions that we're going to ask a little bit uh, really go into how I'm, how I would be able to get her into, into running with me because I've never done it before. And, and mainly the reason why is I didn't know how to get her started. And 
And so we'll kind of talk about Maggie just a little bit. Uh, she, she definitely loves to get out. She's very active. Uh, she loves to run. Uh, she is very excitable. And, and so that's kind of one of the things that I want to make sure that if I take her out to a place where it's, uh, in the public and there might be other dogs out there that you know, she's going to behave the way that I, I think that she needs to. So that way she's having a good time because I, I, I want her to have a good time. So, you know, what sort of consideration do I need to take into, uh, my consideration whenever, um, whenever I'm wanting to get started with her right now, she's two years old. So definitely. So, th- so the first thing to do is to um, do a vet check. So if you've had her into the vet recently, that's wonderful. And getting their recommendations on how far your dog can go and what type of exercise. For a lot of dogs, my dad wrote a book. Um, my dad, Dr. Marty Becker, wrote a book called Fitness Unleashed. And it's all about working out with your pet and getting them the exercise that they need and doing it in a way that you can stay healthy with your dog. And one of the, the main recommendations in, in there is to increase your exercise by 5% each week with your dog until you meet that realistic goal for them. And so for a lot of dogs, it may be uh, starting off with a mile or two is usually adequate for, for most dogs that are young and fit. Um, that's usually not too much. Um, but actually about over 50% of dogs are overweight or obese. And a lot of people don't, don't actually even realize that their dog isn't just fluffy furred, but actually has a little bit of stuff going on underneath all that fur. Um, so for some dogs, it, it really is important to uh, really get them in there gradually because we can, we can definitely do some, some damage and, and, um, uh, other things to them if we go too fast and do too much too soon. So just like a person where we ease into that. It's also really important to do that with our pets. So really increasing your exercise about 5% each week and also doing intervals. Intervals are a great way to get your dog into running. And for a dog that maybe is, is really excitable or some do- sometimes a very common thing with a lot of dogs is that they are somewhat reactive on leash. So maybe the dog is friendly and just great off leash, but they get really, really excited or um, like to bark when they see other dogs or people. And for those dogs, definitely doing exercises with them. You can you can work with them in a walk around other dogs at a distance. So doing things like where we can reward them for doing alternative behaviors and pair pair dogs and people with good things, and really work on getting their attention at a slower pace. But definitely, we want to work on that separately from when we're actually running. So one thing that you could do for a dog that is really excitable or that is reactive is to find a place where an open area or a trail where there are fewer people that are passing. So you can run with your dog in that area and practice it there and then separately really practice the being comfortable around a lot of stuff going on or or in more crowded areas in a walking pace before putting those together. So that's, that's a very helpful thing to do. And if you are in you're on a trail that's, that's usually quiet, if you do see a person or another dog coming up and your dog normally does get excited, one thing you can even do is go off to the side of the trail and even work on some of your, your training exercises there. So some of the exercises, I have some online that, that you could even look at on how to keep your dog calm when they see other dogs or when they see other people. So you can really work on those and manage that behavior as well as, as you're easing into the exercise. But for a lot of dogs, once they really get the hang of running, that in and of itself becomes such a, a reward if they really enjoy doing that. And they get so focused, it's almost like they're going off to work. So a lot of times just getting that outlet really decreases some of that excitable behavior. So that starts starts to taper off as well as you practice more with them. M- Mikhail, you just made Andy's day when you said run intervals with your dog. I, I, he's probably <laughs> over there jumping up and down with joy. <laughs> That, that's been that's been my world the last few weeks is intervals and I'm I'm tired. <laughs> I'm... <laughs> Does someone need to rub but your I, belly, Andy? <laughs> that that would be nice. I'll lay over on my back and stick my feet up in the air, and someone can rub my belly. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have another question that you know I my dog is very fast. Uh, I, I'm I've uh, I've paced her with a four wheeler out in our pasture and, and, and she can go upwards to 35 miles per hour. I mean, she's very athletic. Uh, what do I need to do to slow my dog down? Because obviously she can outrun me and I want to make sure that she's not pulling on the leash because that's one of the concerns that I have that she just wants to go. How, how do you, how do you 
teach a dog to, you know, hang back with me? Yeah, that's, that's a really great point. So there are a few things that you can do. So definitely looking at the equipment that you have. And I do like front clip harnesses a lot for decreasing pulling. And we can do that in a very kind way with just a little bit of gentle pressure when they pull. But not all front clip harnesses are ideal for running because some of them actually go have a strap that goes all the way across the chest. So it restricts their movement and their, their leg and chest movement. So when you look at a front clip, it's ideal to get one that clips in the dog's chest that also, instead of going all the way across with a band that goes all the way across their chest, there are some that actually go in between the front legs and then go up higher um, towards the dog's neck. So it allows free movement of the dog when they run. So that's really an ideal piece of equipment because that's going to give you a lot more control when you're running and also allows that free movement of your dog. So that's, that's a, an ideal piece. And a lot of them, there are some that actually have the option to go from the front clip to the back clip as well. So as your dog uh, gets better and really eases into that pace with you, then you could always switch over to that, that back clip area. So that's, that's definitely one way. And really, when you're working with your dog on leash, whether you are jogging or at a walk, it is important to teach them the the red light, green light game. So whenever the leash goes tight and they start to pull, uh, that's when we either stop or we, or we gently turn and go in the opposite direction. So our dog learns that, Hey, whenever I pull, I don't get to keep going forward in the direction that I want to go. And being consistent with that is really helpful. Now there are some dogs that, that definitely do pull more on leash. And one thing that we can do for them is we can differentiate between actual walking out on leash when we're out in public versus when we're out jogging with our dogs. So for those that that really maybe don't mind that as much, one thing you can do to limit the jarring of your dog pulling forward is to actually get a a bungee type leash. So those have sort of bungee material that that has some give to it. So it it limits that pull when your dog does pull forward. Uh, But ideally what we do want to do is even teach our dog to run at our side. And we can do that by teaching our dog to heel on leash at a walk and then also practice that at a jogging pace. And some easy ways to do that would be as you walk with your dog, you can even have, as you're practicing this in a walk, you can even practice with a little bit of smeared peanut butter on the end of a wooden spoon or a little bit of even um, spray cheese. So just a little bit of that on the end of the spoon and we can get them right at our side. So I usually pick your right or the left side and have that consistent for everyone in your family and the same for both the walk, the walk and the jog. So they have that consistent side that they stay on. And that also will help a lot with um, keeping you from tripping over your dog because sometimes it's very difficult when they're, they're going back and forth in front of us and, and it's really easy to trip over the top of them, especially if they, they stop to sniff something. So if they're on our side, it's a lot safer. And so as we use that, that treat on, this, on the end of the spoon, or we can even funnel treats out to our hand, we want to have that, so usually I pick my left side, and I want to treat them right when, when their shoulder is in line with my pant seam on the left side. So whenever they're there, I'll just use a word like good or yes, or you can even use a clicker. And what that does is it signals to our dogs what they're doing in that moment that's earning them that reward. So just a little lick of the, sp- uh, lick of the treat from the spoon or a little treat that's funneled out. And as our dogs start to really get that game, they can go from a few steps to more and more steps to all of a sudden they like, wow, okay, I get this. Oh, this is fun. And, and actually running in and of itself is that reward for staying at our side. So it, it, it becomes more of a habit. It becomes really natural and easy for our dogs to be able to do that. And isn't that what your wife does to you? Yeah, yeah, she's got a clicker, and whenever I do something, clicker and she some licks, peanut butter, and, or then, and then cheese. she she lets me lick the spoon of peanut butter. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> it encourages me to be good. <laughs> now, now Mikhail, that's perfect. Well, be easy. A, a question I had: um, I think all of us have dreams of getting on the trail and running with our dogs off leash. How does one go about starting that type of training? Do you need to consult a professional for that? You know, I I was with a lot of dogs. It really takes looking at the individual dog because there's some dogs that are just highly responsive and they just naturally are really, really in tune with their person. And for those dogs, it definitely does take training, even for the most naturally at your side type of dogs to learn to still be responsive and to come back, especially in the face of something like a bunny or a deer, or maybe they see another dog. So it does take a lot of practice working up to that. 
And I would definitely say that there's some dogs where, where that goal wouldn't be realistic. So it's really looking at the dog and their individual personality. But for those dogs that, that are, are responsive and, and definitely we can train dogs to be more responsive. Um, it, it definitely could be a realistic goal if, if you have an off leash area that, that you can do that in. Um, but for those dogs that are prone to running off, I had a fox terrier growing up who was that type who the, the, the minute you open the door, the minute she was off leash, she would just dash and it would, it would be me running to go catch her. And it, it was awful. And now I know better. Now I know that if my dog were to run away, I wouldn't go running after them. And instead, a lot of times it was actually better is to run in the opposite direction or to even fall on the ground and to, to kind of start making a scene and, and, uh, uh, kicking or, um, kind of just being, uh, just being very interesting. A lot of times they're more, more likely to come back if you do something like that versus when you chase after them. Um, but for those dogs, definitely that, that wouldn't be realistic. But if you have, uh, and we were talking about labs. So if you have that, that really, um, kind of at your side lab or golden retriever or uh, poodle or whatever it may be. If you have the dog with the right personality, it definitely could be a, a great goal to do and really practice the come on call. And I would really practice your leave it as well as, as well as being able to do that, that off leash heel. And those would be some very helpful things that, that would help you on, on your journey to being able to run off leash with your dog. Miss Crystal, join the conversation. Yeah, so I, we're talking about the trails and stuff. I imagine kind of trails and those kinds of softer surfaces would be ideal. But for some of us that can't get out to the trails and we're going to be running with our dogs on harder surfaces, such as the sidewalk and the streets, are there kind of different considerations that we need to think about? Um, and I also think a bit about like the seasons with, you know, the hot in the summer and then maybe salt and stuff um, in the winter time. Oh, definitely. I think that's a very great point. So one thing is to really test the temperature of the ground that your dog is running on. So one way that you can test that is taking your hand and putting it down on the pavement and leaving it there for 10 seconds. If it's too hot for your hand, it's too hot for your dog's paws. So our dog's paws, unlike shoes, they can really feel it just like our hands. So we want to take that into consideration. And for a lot of dogs, it's, it's better, especially in the summertime, to go in the cool of the day, so that may be earlier in the morning or, or in the evening time. And some other things that you can do, too, is you can look at even, uh, for some dogs, they can learn to wear booties. So uh, Rough Wear has, has some great dog shoes um, that dogs can learn to wear, and it, it does help protect their paws, especially those dogs that are running on ground that can really uh, cut up their feet or ground that's, that's hot. Uh, that can be very helpful for them. And you can also put some, some different types of petroleum gels on their feet. Um, so it's, it's a, or a type of balm on their paws that helps protect their paws from things like the de-icers. And my dad, as a veterinarian, always recommends for me, whether it's a dog out in a walk or a potty break or if, if I was going out on a run, to always wipe our dog's paws off before they come in the house. And one of the, the top problems that dogs have is actually, um, uh, with skin is is allergies and one of the best things you can do is by wiping off your feet uh, or by wiping off their feet you're actually taking all those extra excess allergens on their coat and you're removing them so their their fur is all you can almost think of it like a like a swiffer so they're a, a four-legged swiffer so whatever is outside when they walk on it they pick it up and take it back in so whether it's the icer or some of those those season, seasonal allergens that they can pick up so by wiping on their paws, that's very, very helpful as well. Okay, I've got one more question before we get on to some questions that some of our listeners have uh, have sent in to us to ask you. But And I think this is really important. And as runners, uh, one thing that's really important to us during our runs is hydration and, and also you know fueling and what we eat and food. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious, because, because a dog can't ask for something to eat or something to drink, what are some of the signs that we need to look for to say that, hey, my dog is thirsty or uh, or may, maybe my dog's hungry uh, while we're out on the run? And what are what do you need to do to take care of their needs whenever you're maybe out for a little bit longer than usual? Yeah, so, so one thing to look at is if your dog is normally up in front, kind of right there at your side, if they start to lag behind even a little bit. And our dogs don't complain and they still want to keep going, but they can easily overheat and that can lead to heat exhaustion, overheating, and uh, there can be a lot of problems with that. So we really need to be the ones that monitor and, and help them take those breaks. So 
you may even notice just subtle signs, like your dog starting to go more towards shadow, trying to, to seek some cool. Um, or you may even notice them, um, a lot of times if there are puddles out in the ground or if you're taking a drink and your dog looks really eager, um, it's, it's important that whenever we feel thirsty that we try and offer our dog some water as well. And, and to also give them those breaks and really to pay attention if we see our dogs just starting to move back a little bit or, one thing I see a lot is I'll see people running and the dog's lagging way, way behind. A lot of times if that person were to stop, that dog would just kind of collapse on the ground or want to lay down. So we, we, a lot of times as humans, we have a lot more endurance than our dogs and we can handle the heat a lot better. Now that's not with all dogs. There are definitely some breeds that, that have that very high endurance, but they really don't have the same ability to expel heat as we do, um, because they actually, they don't sweat through their skin. They sweat through their paws and they expel heat through panting. So they don't have, and they also are wearing a fur coat. So you can imagine it's really, it's very difficult for them to stay cool. So giving them those water breaks and, and some things that we can do too is, is to have even a, there are different water bottle attachments or even collapsible bowls that you can take with you. So those are, are small things that you can take that, that will help you to keep your dog hydrated and, so definitely pay attention to your dog signal. So maybe they can only join you for part of your run, depending upon how far you go. Now, I, I have a follow-on question. Many of us will go out for these four, five, six, seven-hour runs, and we're not carrying pure water. We have a like an endurance drink mix that's got electrolytes, salt, some sugar. I think some Smurf berries are in some of them. Can you give that to a dog? You know, I am not sure. I think it, it probably depends upon the ingredients that are in there. I do know, though, that they have, they actually have different, uh, sports drinks for dogs and that have, that have some of those electrolytes like you were talking about and have other ingredients. And without being as into that, um, I don't know the exact ingredients or anything, but that would definitely be very interesting to look into. Okay. Andy, you're, you get on that. Okay, yeah, I'll... I'll, I'll we, need, <laughs> we need to get sword for dogs now. Exactly. There, there you go. There you go. Good one. Okay. <laughs> it's a whole new product line for them. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, we'll get, we'll get that devised because we are scientists. All right, Andy. We've been time. <laughs> Andy, before we get into listener questions, I have got a question that's been on my mind for years. I, I, I have become a little, not famous, maybe infamous as like the dog runner. I am always picking up dogs when I'm running because I'm out in the country. And I mean, they've run with me for 11 miles, 10 miles. Um, it seems like every month one follows me home. In fact, one this weekend followed me for you know, a little less than three miles, walked right in the house. My kids are so used to it. They just said, oh, hey, dog. And I have to try to find the owners. Wow. Then. So I'm wondering, because I have got, Crystal can testify to this. I've got an attack Jack Russell. <laughs> oh he's vicious oh yeah he's super vicious <laughs> he's a 15 year old jack russell so <laughs> so i'm wondering can your dog kind of i don't know mark you as like hey this is a hell of a guy treat him right type thing because i never have <laughs> issues with dogs they they i hate to say they love me but i've never had a dog issue ever that that is pretty amazing you know i i uh I, I, I would imagine, I mean, definitely you, you probably have really great body language, um, because dogs definitely pick up on, <laughs> dogs definitely pick up on, um, different subtle signals. So, so you probably display signs of friendliness and being a, a good dog person. And probably because you, you lack any real negative experience, you don't have the same body language that someone might have if they have a little bit of fear or trepidation. So for, for someone that has been attacked or has been followed by a dog or had their, um, you know, a dog that's, that's kind of nipping at their heels, uh, they may have a different reaction. And so it may even just be stiffening up or kind of um, bracing themselves versus if you are nice and relaxed, a lot of times dogs will see that as friendliness too. Um, but definitely uh, pets can pick up on different things like pheromones and also different signals of, of our stress. So things even like uh, cortisol, I, I think that there may be things like that that dogs pick up on that we don't even know about. So it's definitely possible. And I, I think you just must be a pretty cool dude, though. It sounds, <laughs> sounds like you, 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 you have a lot of fun. I think that's, that's a really neat story. I love it. I mean, I kid you not, there was one time I go by this farmer's house and he had a pack of beagles. There must have been 
at least 10 of them and they all came out and ran with me like two miles down the road. I turned around, they came back another two miles and then they went back home. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just like, I, that is so funny. I don't know what's going on with me and dogs, but, uh, Maybe you missed your calling. <laughs> Maybe I did. I yeah, know. no kidding. I'm out of here, guys. I'll see you later. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, as Andy alluded to, we do have many listener questions, and I know we're on a bit of a time schedule. Uh, it looks like the first one we kind of covered as far as what to look for in a breed. Um, Crystal, do you want to read the one um, from Marine Officer Springfield? Because th- that's Mr. Richard, because that is probably the most asked question. I know probably most of us get concerning dogs and running. Yes. And I think it kind of ties back to, you know, to talk about running in the country only, this is the, a little bit of the opposite experience. And he was asking, what's a good non-injurious way to keep dogs from biting and chasing you while running? Um, as he puts it, these rednecks out here, let their dogs run all over the back roads and they are completely undisciplined. And I feel bad when I have to take the only steps I know for getting an aggressive animal to back down. So, so a lot of dogs, definitely, the thing that really draws dogs in, which I think is absolutely amazing that, that you've had such great experiences before with, with dogs wanting to run with you rather than chase after you, because a lot of dogs are that maybe don't see a lot of runners or sometimes they just get that frustration or, or sometimes have, have some of those uh, more territorial type of behaviors. And their instinct may be more to chase after and to chase that thing away. Um, so it's, it's very, very common when we're running and if we keep running, um, for that dog to want to go after us. So one of the best things you can do is actually to just stop your movement. So if you, um, I'm a little bit of a jogger, I, I'm sure I'm nothing even close to what, what, um, you all are, but whenever I see a dog that I'm a little bit uncertain about, and it may just be the way that dog is kind of carrying themselves or especially a dog off leash, I'll, I'll always go from a, a a jog or a, a run into a walk because a walk is a lot less likely to draw that dog in. And, and for those dogs that really are really running up to us, absolutely just stopping and being very, very uninteresting. So, um, it's called be a tree. So you want to be just like a tree where you fold your hands in, you're completely still, you don't look at the dog, you look away from the dog and you just are very, very uninteresting. And for the vast majority of dogs, they'll lose interest and they'll walk away. And most dogs, it's not that they even want to injure or hurt that person, even though they can look scary. For a lot of dogs, it's just like, oh boy, there's something right there to chase or, or that's really exciting. And, and they learn. So they, they get that reinforcement of that person running as they run. So it turns into this fun game. So if we just take that, that movement away, that's really helpful. And then another thing, too, is to not just turn and keep moving away um, or to jog past that dog. So for those dogs that, that do have some fear, a lot of times they're more likely to bite if we have our backs turned. So if we just um, keep going past them rather than backing away, I would definitely suggest backing away because when we're backing away, the dog is less likely to actually go in for a bite versus if we have our backs turned. And that's why a lot of dogs, that have fear issues, you'll, you'll hear of them, um, biting that person's calf or the back of the leg. And, um, so, so definitely backing away from that dog is less likely to end up in a bite. Uh, a few other things too. So if you have your dog with you or, or a lot of times I'll even just take treats with me. Um, I kind of have that thing where I, it, I feel like I always kind of see stray dogs. So I, I usually will, um, whenever I see them, I use those treats for that to, to, um, get that dog and help them. But, the other benefit of having treats on you is that you can actually use that as a really good distraction. So even just having like Cheerios with you, so it's something really light and um, tossing a handful of that at the dog as they come up, it can distract them long enough to help you get away and it also makes you less threatening to that dog. Uh, some other things too are to even have some sprays. So there's some sprays like the citronella spray um, that uh, postal workers a lot of times will carry, and that can be helpful. And, and there are also things that are, are like cans of air, so it makes it kind of a, a scary noise. And so for those dogs that maybe are are more threatening and, and aren't really backing off with with the the trying to to be still, you can use that as well. And for a lot of dogs, if we interact with them in a way that they understand, that's why I really like to even even asking that dog to sit or 
asking them to lie down or ask, asking them something that they might know. A lot of times it helps them to see you as more of a friend than an enemy. Now, is there a difference, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Sean, over at the Negative Splits podcast, we, we talk all the time, he lives in the city, and he says city dogs are, gen- he thinks they're generally more aggressive than country dogs, and I tend to agree with that. Is that because they're penned in and there's other dogs so close that really aren't part of their pack? Yeah, you know, and actually, one thing I was thinking of earlier when you were mentioning running out in the country, the other thing that they probably don't have there that a lot of dogs in kind of suburban areas may have are a lot of, a lot of, there are a lot of invisible fences, at least where I'm at in the Seattle area. And um, that, or even just uh, dogs that are behind a fence that see people passing by all the time, it can be really frustrating for them. So it's just so frustrating. They can't get to that person. They keep seeing these people go past, or especially for those dogs on coyotes. So, Dogs that are chained are actually um, uh, one of the most likely groups of dogs to be aggressive are those that are chained up or tie- tied up because it is so frustrating for them that they can't get to what they want to get to, but they're exposed to everything, so it's scary. They can't get away. So a lot of dogs are pushed into, into that, um, that aggressive and, and almost defensive behavior in, in that way, whereas dogs that are off in the country. My family were, were actually from Idaho and it's definitely the same way where most dogs that you come across are, are more likely to be friendly and, you know, have, have that, that, um, that freedom to move and to go as they please versus those dogs that are more restricted and definitely not the case for every dog. As some dogs that, that are in the country, they have, they have a very, very limited friend group. So they only know a few people and that's all they were exposed to. So anything outside of that, they're likely to be defensive towards. But for, for a lot of dogs, definitely that frustration that's ongoing can increase that aggressive behavior. Okay. And one other thing I didn't mention earlier too, is if, if you have an object on you, so if you have a backpack or um, just really anything, so even a, a sweatshirt, you can use things like that as an object between you and the dog. So um, uh, that's something that, that I might do in, in a, and, and that's really in the, those extreme cases, but that is something that you can also use as a barrier between you and the dog. Well, I want to make sure that we Adam's question because he was really excited about, uh, about this topic for this podcast and he's got five separate questions. So we might just have to go rapid fire on this one in the time that we have. Uh, but, but he's really interested in this because he's got a year and a half old chocolate lab and uh, he would love to be able to take trail running, but he's very hyper and strong as an ox. Uh, so he drags me around everywhere. Uh, so he just has some general questions just to help him and his dog out to make sure they have a good time out there on the trail. And so the first question is, uh, what age should you start training them? Yeah, so so really one thing to look at, so for pro- probably for a lab, he's probably right, right around that sweet spot. So for most dogs, it's around about a year and a half of age is when their growth plates have, have fully closed. But for some dogs, especially those giant breeds, it may be about 18 months until their growth plates are fully closed. So um, paying attention to that. So it's usually between 12 to 18 months of age. And that's something you can talk to your veterinarian about as well. Uh, but even for those dogs that maybe can't fully go into jogging yet, you can definitely practice some of those maneuvers that you would do on a jog, like being able to have them walk at your side and even teaching them things like um, directional cues. So teaching them to turn left or to turn right. You can practice all of that early on as well. But it sounds like he's, okay. he's right at the, the perfect time. Okay. Well, we're, we're going to jump back to a question that Brandon had that I skipped over. Uh, and he had heard about people teaching them left and right. You just mentioned that. Uh, how, how, would you, how would you go about teaching a dog to understand left and right? Yeah. So, so one thing you can do, you could just have one cue, such as turn. So a turn cue just means for your dog to look up at you and to follow with you which, whichever direction you go. So I'll use that a lot out on walks where I'll say the word turn. And I'll, as I teach it in class, what I'll do is I'll just have a treat out in front of that dog's nose as I say turn. And I'll use that treat to almost steer the dog in the direction that I'm going. And so over time, I can, I can remove that treat from my hand and just have my hand shaped like I have a treat in it. And I'll say the word turn use my hand, turn with the dogs, and then give them that reward. Once they learn it with treats, it becomes natural for them, and it just becomes another form of communication. So we don't have to use the treats all of the time, but just the movement forward becomes that reward for them. And if we're teaching actual directional cues, which is definitely possible, what we want to do is to say our cues such as um, right or left. So we can say left, 
turn or right turn. And so we just go ahead and say that before we turn in that direction. So in the same way that we teach the turn, just every time that we teach the left turn, for instance, we would always turn in this direction. And for those dogs that, that are, are canine brainiacs, they can definitely learn that really fast. And for other dogs, it might take a little bit, a bit more time. You can also even toss a treat or a toy in that direction to get them to go that way, even when you aren't walking with them on leash. All right. Well, uh, back back to Adam's questions. Uh, we already covered earlier in the podcast about you know the amount of mileage and about increasing it. So we'll go to his third question. Uh, there are different commands uh, that should be taught. What to, what commands should be taught to your dog prior to training them to run? So definitely looking at uh, a heel is important, and separate from that, teaching your dog to walk on a loose leash. That's very helpful. Uh, also, it's great if you have a cue that says, let's go, or something that, that lets your dog know that you're speeding up, as well as giving them a cue for um, for slowing down. So it might be easy, or you might even use a word like, whoa, for your dog, or stop. So you can teach them to slow down and also to stop with you. So that's very helpful. A leave it is extremely helpful for a lot of dogs, especially those dogs that, hey, I see a squirrel, or whatever it is that might catch your attention to teach them to leave that alone and still keep moving with you. And definitely the weight and the stay cues are important as well to, um, so say that you're crossing the street rather than your dog's barging forward, that they learn to wait with you before they're released to go ahead. Uh, so those are some helpful, helpful behaviors to teach your dog. Okay. Any tips for, uh, leash training a hyper dog? Definitely. So, the front clip harnesses, that's something I, I really am, am big on because that gives you a lot more control over your dog's forward movement and also their direction. Um, so, And also what we want to do is we want to think of what's rewarding for our dog. So being able to move forward can be rewarding for them or even getting the leash put on. So it's important to start your dog in a calmer, calmer kind of um, frame of mind so where they're more relaxed. Um, So not necessarily that they have to be relaxed because we are going to go running, but we don't want them to be kind of so excitable and just not even thinking about us and that person that's attached to the other end of the leash. We want to get their attention on us so that we can have that that communication between us. So that starts really before you even put their, their leash on. So asking your dog for something like, a sit before we clip on that leash or for a dog, maybe it's like jumping up. And I'm, I, I have lots of dogs in my mind that I've worked with, but I can just picture in this moment where they may just be jumping up, spinning, barking, just so excited to go out and go running or to go out on their walk. So if we can catch a moment of calm and reward them for that, yes, or good. And then clip on that leash. And um, that in and of itself is a reward. Opening the door and going out is a reward. Or for those dogs that love to run, just going into that run is a big reward in and of itself. So we want to pay attention to what behaviors we are actually rewarding because a lot of times we're actually rewarding behaviors maybe we don't want so much of, which is maybe like the barking or the spinning. So we want to, we want to really pay attention to those calm behaviors and especially those times when our dogs check in with us. So just giving us a calm eye contact, for instance, could be a big reward. And we can also use treats and praise and petting to reward our dogs as well, just depending upon what our dogs really like. Okay, one final question. We moved through, through these uh, uh, really good. Uh, should dogs follow a human training plan uh, for distances such like a half marathon or a full marathon, or do they need to have different adaptations or or recovery needs, or should they or should they be less mileage than that? And I think we talked about that a little bit earlier to where you know humans have the ability to go farther than dogs. Uh, but anyway, to, to answer his question, what do you think on doing a half or full marathon training plan with your dog? I think it's possible depending upon the breed and also the time of year. So if we have like a husky type of dog and, and a really healthy dog, or their vet is cleared and it's it's nice weather. We have a Rhodesian Ridgeback or a Visa, um, Dalmatian, Weimarimer. Um, there are definitely certain breeds that, that are, are more built for that type of behavior uh, and to do the longer distances or, or border collie, for instance, or uh, there could be an Australian shepherd or certain dogs or maybe even a labradoodle. So it really depends upon the dog's build and also their endurance level. And our dogs will let us know through little signs on how they're doing. But the vast majority of dogs, they can't go that far, um, especially with the heat. Um, but you can definitely work your dog up to it, especially for those breeds that really are built for that type of of running. So uh, really that uh, increasing about 5% each week is ideal 
And and I would say kind of the, the upper limit would be 10% each week, but that's, that's definitely more of a lofty goal. So we want to give our dogs breaks and really ease them into it. And it actually helps their paws, too, because their paws actually have to form some calluses on them because otherwise they'll just crack open and bleed if they go too far too fast. So um, paying attention to that and really making sure that we do it in the cool of the day, that's, that's one of the biggest factors is just the temperature outside. So making sure that our, our dog isn't going to overheat is really important. And in those intervals and really that 5% each week would be kind of the, kind of the, the go zone for our dogs. All right. Well, uh, Steven, Crystal, do you have any more questions? You know, I would just hope that uh, Mikkel would be willing to come back on because I think I could talk to her for about another two or three hours uh, concerning dogs and running. <laughs> oh, I would love to. It's It's been such a joy. It went by so fast. And I have so many dog stories to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I would love to hear them. <laughs> oh, man. I, I actually have to go off to go teach a dog class now. So get to go do some more well, training. But I, I absolutely love being able to talk with all of you. And thank you so much for having me on the show. Thank you. And before you go, I want to make sure people know how to find you. Um, you know, what are, what are all your different socials, websites, all of that? Um, if you can let us know those, and we'll make sure to include it in the show notes as well. Oh, wonderful. So you can find me at fearfreepets.com or at fearfreehappyhomes.com. And those are both really great websites as well for finding out a lot of great information to help your pet live, live a happier, healthier, fuller life. And I also am on Facebook at Mikkel Becker, facebook.com slash Mikkel Becker, and it's M-I-K-K-E-L Becker. And also on Instagram, uh, Mikkel Becker. And I do a little bit of Twitter as well. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, definitely, this has been great. This is a unique show. And uh, hopefully we can help a lot of people out there to help not only their their people to have an enjoyable experience, but also their, their pets and dogs, too, to get out on the trails and have just as much fun as we're having. So uh, if you are going to the Chicago Marathon uh, this year, then uh, look me up. I'll be there also if you are in the area. Crystal and Stephen will be running the Ragnar 200-mile bourbon chase Woo-hoo! on the team. Wow. So anyway, where, where's that, where's that going to be at? Uh, it starts in, where is that, ba- Baston, Kentucky? Is that it, Crystal? It starts in Bardstown. Bardstown, from Bardstown to Lexington. Yes, yeah, it follows the whole bourbon trail. Yeah, we're going to hit all the distilleries. <laughs> well, we will be looking forward to checking in on Crystal and Stephen with that. I'll certainly be giving you updates. I'm peeking out on my marathon training right now. I'm probably about three weeks from taper, and so I'm sleepy and hungry all the time. Anyway, do you guys have anything else? No, I think that's it. All that's right. It. Well, yes. Okay, well, I would like to give a shout out to the Ozark Mountain Daredevils for the use of their music on the podcast. Uh, If you want any more information about us, you can go to www.heartlandrunning.com, and that's where the show notes are going to be. Also, join the Facebook group. We're going to be closing it pretty soon, and the only way to get on it after that will be... Someone has to die. Someone die. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so anyway if you want to call the show uh, you can call our voicemail at area code 417-319-1060 if you've got some trail reviews uh, you want to talk about some gear or something interesting to talk about we like what you have to say we'll put you on a show and then like we said at the beginning of the show make sure you tell a friend go over to itunes and give us a review so that way people can help find the podcast so anyway we once again like to thank Mikkel for coming on to the show and and my name's Andy. I'm Crystal. And I'm Stephen. And we'll see you next time.